And I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what we do after we have been running these fancy instruments and, and the technologies that Olga has described. Uh, when it comes to the bioinformatics and sort of the pipelines that we have set up. And I will go through this quite briefly because there's just too much to talk about. So instead of sort of digging too deep into everything, uh, you will get sort of a wider perspective. And I will also talk about some things that I think are, are really cool when it comes to these technologies because I, I'm also very much involved in uh, research and development projects and sort of thinking about how we can make use of these. Uh, instruments and all the data that we generate. Uh, and please uh, stop me and interrupt if you have any questions. I think it's really cool to be talking to a live audience after being on Zoom for a couple of years. So uh, it would be good with some interactions. Okay, so what I will talk about today is first some things about how we handle the data that we generate at the when it comes to whole human genome sequencing, that's something that we're doing quite a lot of, how we take care of those uh, data types and what kind of analysis can we provide. I will also briefly touch upon the Earth Biogenome Project when it comes to the analysis or sort of some of the challenges in the projects that Olga talked about, and also some other uh, research and development activities that we are involved in at, the, at our platform. Uh, okay, so first, 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 uh, we're talking about the, the handling of the data uh, because we have all these sequencing instruments There's in, in these corridors uh, around this building and they generate tons of data. We need some, some way to take care of them, uh, of all this data as efficiently as possible. And this is quite a lot of work for us. So there are many bioinformaticians uh, employed at the platforms to try to deal with all of this. Uh, and exactly how this is set up it looks a bit different sort of for different types of instruments but basically we have a sequencing instrument uh, and attached to that we have some big types of servers or uh, that has a lot of storage and also compute power to sort of in real time uh, take care of the of the data that is produced uh, we also need to sort of have backups of some of the most important things in case this you know, something crashes, uh, we don't want to sort of uh, have all the sequencing spoiled. Uh, and also some initial pre-processing. So that's sort of done at our side. Um, and then we are in quite lucky to have the resources from UPMAX. So we have an sort of internal cluster at, at UPMAX uh, where we can do the production, as we say, for, for the data analysis. Uh, so that's sort of where we run some pipelines. Uh, and then when we have been doing that, we can move the data over uh, to somewhere else where you can pick it up. Uh, here it's mentioned something called GRUS. So briefly say a few words about that, but the whole system for delivering data is now being changed. So, so there's a new system coming. Uh, and once the data has been uploaded, then you will get a notification that, okay, your sequencing run is done. Uh, you can now log in and in some way access the data and put it on either one of the UPMAC servers or perhaps even on, onto your own computer. Uh, maybe some of you have already experienced this. Otherwise, I'm sure that you will once you start to generate data. It, it's not always super easy. And especially sort of the, the PIs sometimes also need to be involved in this. A thing you know with setting up the accounts and everything and it can be yeah uh, a bit tricky sometimes so it's good to also have a technical person associated to the project that can take care of this okay so when it comes to the pipelines what can we do uh so we have set up some pipelines for the normal types of analysis that you know people are running quite a lot of and maybe these are not all the ones i'm sure there, there are a few other ones as well but some of the basic analyses that we can do is mapping. We take all the sequencing reads that we generate and align it uh, to a reference genome. Oops. Yes. Uh, and once we have done uh, alignment, we can also look for uh, variants. Uh, so that's an SNV calling. We find SNPs or perhaps small indels. Uh, that's a typical type of analysis for human genomes. Uh, if we're doing RNA sequencing, 
uh, we first do alignment, and then we can also quantify uh, the gene expression levels for all the human genes or other genes from other species as well. Uh, if we're doing de novo sequencing, you know, sequencing of all these species that Olga talked about, then we also have some resources for, for generating uh, these uh, de novo assemblies. But that's a bit more complex sometimes, and we cannot sort of do all of those projects, perhaps. Uh, and there are any more things. So, for example, like single cell uh, analysis and such things. But one important thing here is that the analysis that we're running, they're supposed to be, I mean, for us, it's important that they are automated because we're doing a lot of analyses. They need to be reliable, uh, easy to run, and also reproducible. So we sort of can recreate uh, the results from the raw data. Uh, and how do we do this? Uh, well, one thing that has been very much invested in development, uh, especially at the Stockholm side of, uh, of NGI is something called NF Core. So that's a community set uh, sort of, of building pipelines. It's not, I mean, and it's geared towards uh, core facilities. And the idea is sort of to put all of these analysis tools into one framework. Uh, and the lot of development has been going on at SciLife Lab, but it's not sort of that NF Core is only a SciLife Lab project. It's much bigger than that. And uh, one of the main persons that has been driving this is Phil Ewells uh, in Stockholm. He was working at the NGI, but now he's moved on. But, but I think this is a really great thing. Uh, and it makes life easy for us. And the one example of a pipeline that we can run in this setting is uh, this one. This is called SOREC, and it's for looking at cancer genomes and comparing it to normal uh, DNA from the same patient. Uh, so then you can sort of in an easy way input the data and then get information about mutations, structural variations, copy number variations that are, are occurring in the cancer. Uh, and we are involved in developing these types of pipelines. In this case, it was uh, together with the Bontrimer Banken and also Pembis. Uh, and the nice thing is that sort of when the pipeline has been developed, then it can be reused for all similar types of projects. Uh, one important thing is quality control, uh, and we also have a way of doing that in a very automated way, at least for sort of the standard Illumina projects. Uh, there is something called multi-QC that will give you a very nice report uh, of the run performance, the read length distribution, the sequencing quality, uh, and sort of maybe you have been doing sequencing at our place, have received these types of reports. Uh, and yeah, you will basically get a web page. You can click around and see, okay, here are all my samples. What are the statistics? And if some specific sample sticks out that didn't perform well, then it will be in some way flagged. And you can sort of perhaps go back and see, okay, is there something strange going on with this particular sample? Uh, the data delivery, I briefly mentioned that. Uh, right now it's done to something called GRUS. And that's an bookmax system where you we create a delivery system. So we sort of take our data from our place, we put it onto this GRUS, and then you will get notified that, okay, someone has created a, a project for you, and you can then access this project and download it to your own computer. But you need to set up an account in a specific system. In this case, it's called SNCC Super, but this whole thing will sort of change uh, very soon. Um, so it will be done in a different way. So there's something called the data delivery system now from uh, the data center that we will start to use. Actually, we haven't sort of fully transitioned to this yet, so I cannot describe exactly how it's done, but there is uh, a video available at NGI Stockholm that will show you how to do this. Uh, okay. So did you have any questions about sort of our the processing on the data, you know, on our side and so how we get it to you? Okay, then I will move on a bit uh, and talk about some of the research and development projects and sort of some things in human and, and uh, biodiversity sequencing. Uh, so in some cases uh, at NGI, so we see that, okay, these types of projects are 
extremely sort of common or important for us. We think that many people want to do the same type of sequencing. Then we can allocate some resources for, for a development project. Uh, so it could be, for example, you know, setting up a pipeline as the example where I just started with the, with the uh, cancer normal sequencing. But in other cases, it could also be to build, you know, reference databases or resources that are useful for the community or other types of strategic uh, collaborations. Uh, so one project that I've been working on quite a lot is something called the Swedian project. Uh, and this is one of these resources. Uh, and the idea with this project was to sequence the genomes of 1,000 Swedish individuals uh, to get a reference uh, database for our population. Uh, and we actually uh, were successful in doing this already back in 2016. We had a release party and had this uh, cake that was very tasty. Yes. Um, okay, and what? why did we do this? What can this project or this database be used for? Uh, and the idea is that we're going to sort of look at genetic variants in the population. If you find, for example, a causative variant or when you're doing clinical sequencing, you have something that you suspect, okay, can this be the cause of this disease? Then you can go to this database and see, okay, what is the frequency of this mutation in the population? If it's super common, it's probably not the, the sort of uh, the cause of, uh, of a rare disease. So it should be in that case, quite rare in this database. Uh, we can also use it as, as match controls. So some study, perhaps you're looking at diabetes and you want to have control population from the same country, then you can use this. Uh, you can also use it for population genetics or even trying to study the human evolutionary history and stuff like that. So there was quite a high demand for this type of data from many different groups already from the very beginning. Uh, so we realized that we really need to make this data as open uh, as quickly as possible for the community. So that was one of the sort of big aims with this project. Uh, and one thing uh, that was also interesting to think about is uh, how do we create a reference population, which individuals should go into this. Uh, and I was sort of not actively taking part in, in this decision, but uh, it ended up being the Swedish twin registry that was the source of these individuals. And not taking the twin pairs, but just one sibling from each twin pair. <coughs> Uh, and the idea here is that twin birth is kind of a random process across the country, so there shouldn't be too many biases. Uh, and the, the distribution of the gen genetic variation should sort of mirror the population in some sense. Um, but this also means that there are people with different types of diseases in this database, so it's not a super healthy board. Uh, and one very important thing why this scores was selected was that there was already available data. So 10,000 individuals have been genotyped uh, on SNP arrays in this population. So we could use this to extract 1,000 individuals. Uh, first, the first thing that was done was to create some kind of PCA plot, just seeing, okay, what is the genetic variation in Sweden compared to other places in Europe? And based on this, we could select uh, 1,000 individuals, uh, sequence them on Illumina. At this point in time, I think it's also kind of interesting that we had these 10 uh, instruments. What, what were they called? The high seek X? X10. X10, yeah. Uh, so I think that these were bought in 2015, and these are all now gone a long time ago. And it was quite expensive. I think we're talking about 100 million crowns or more. Uh, so that also sort of shows the turnaround time in these types of instruments, uh, which is, I mean, it's yeah, a bit scary, but uh, there's no use in running these types of instruments now. Uh, anyway, we were able to sequence these thousand genomes in 2016, uh, and it was done both in Stockholm and Uppsala. And one important thing when doing this type of project is to think about, okay, how do we handle the data that is produced? Because we really needed an automated way to take care of all of this. Uh, and we had some really good colleagues here in Uppsala who set up this whole pipeline. I will not go into all the details, but basically starting with the raw file, the FASTQ file up here, 
and then go through many, many different steps and end up with a big file with uh, all the thousand individuals combined, the sort of the variance that we have and the frequencies. Um, and to run this pipeline, uh, it took about 2 million uh, compute hours on, on the big cluster. So the, uh, there's a very good thing that we have these resources for running lots of analysis in parallel. Otherwise, we've been waiting for, I don't know, many, many years to get this done. Uh, and uh, I think that we generated about 100 terabytes of data. It shouldn't be gigabytes here. So, so it's quite a big data set that we have. Uh, and the nice thing is sort of when we have this pipeline set up, we can then reuse the same type pipeline for all the projects that we're running at the platform. Uh, and it's important to use the same type of pipeline because you can, these pipelines can also introduce slight you know, types of systematic biases. Uh, when it comes to making data available, that's also something that we focus very much on. So we set up a website uh, and it's still available. You can go here, uh, you can look at your favorite gene, you can see the frequencies of the variants in this gene, in this population. And if you want to get access to all the files for the individual, this is like sensitive data. So then you need to go to a special server, Upmax, uh, called Bianca. But it's possible to, to actually do this. Uh, and it's turned out that this was a very nice resource for collaborations. Uh, so there has been more than 100 publications now that makes use of this data for many different types of studies. Uh, and the nice thing is that it's also used in clinical routine uh, diagnostics. Yes, uh, any questions on this part? I, I can mention that we also, in fact, sequence two of these individuals uh, now with all different types of technologies because here I only mentioned Illumina. So we have like PacBio, we have Oxford Nanopore, uh, 10X, uh, MGI, what have you, sort of for, for a couple of these individuals. And the, the idea would then be to also generate de novo sequences for, for some of the individuals in this data set. Yes. Okay. So the next part I would like to talk a bit about is the Earth Biogenome Project. And I think that there's a lot to say here, and I'm not sort of the real expert in this, uh, on this topic, but I would just like to introduce some of the challenges that we have uh, when it comes to assembling all the genomes of uh, all the species on Earth. Um, so one thing with putting genomes together is that sort of like, it can be illustrated as some type of uh, huge puzzle that we're trying to solve here. So we have all of these small pieces uh, that then correspond to sequencing reads, and we want to put them together and get uh, complete uh, chromosomes uh, and genomes uh, out of this. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, a quite difficult thing, and it becomes even more difficult if the pieces are small. Uh, so one thing that so to sort of make this a bit easier uh, is to generate uh, large pieces or longer sequencing reads that we can put together. So that has some, is something that has really changed uh, this, this uh, problem and made it much easier, much more streamlined. Uh, but there are so many different technologies available, as Olga mentioned. Uh, we have the Oxford Nanopore. We have this PacBio, we like these hi-fi reads or the, the high quality reads quite a lot when doing this. Uh, but there are also other things that this high C uh, to generate these contact maps and sort of get more chromosome information. There's also something called BioNano. I don't, don't think Olga mentioned that, that's optical mapping. Uh, we can also use RNA sequencing perhaps to, to sort of make things easier here. Uh, and this is also changing all the time. Uh, so there comes new uh, technologies. And also there, uh, there are many different opinions. Uh, and some people are favoring specific uh, technologies because I don't know, they would like to use them more. Uh, and the thing here is that the choice of these technologies that we're generating or sort of that we're choosing will also really impact uh, the downstream analysis and how much effort you will need to put into the uh, into the analysis. Okay, but, but what's the 
a genome assembly, what are the different parts here? Uh, so we start off with the sequencing reads, and ideally they should be very long and also have a few errors in them. Uh, we then sort of create overlaps between these reads to put them together into something called contexts or continuous uh, sequences. Uh, we then have these bigger contexts. We want to also put them together in some way uh, into something called scaffolds. And sometimes these scaffolds can also contain some, some small gaps of different sizes. Uh, and maybe we then can align these different scaffolds along a chromosome and sort of get an, an idea of how this chromosome looks. Uh, so that's sort of the sort of easy way of describing it. But in reality, in each of these steps, there are many different strategies, algorithms, parameters uh, that can be used. And maybe you need to tweak this uh, depending on the uh, project and sort of what kind of species you're putting together. Is it like diploid? Is it uh, hexaploid or even worse? So then that can make uh, things more difficult. And also the genome sites, of course. Uh, okay, but let's say that we have this complete chromosomes assembled. Um, that's not the end of it because we also want to know what are the functional elements. So what's going on here? What are the genes? Uh, so once the genome is assembled, it also needs to be annotated. So we want to find out where are the genes located. And we can either do this by some computational methods, by comparing uh, genomes from perhaps other species or and genes from other species to our sequences. And so there are good ways of doing that, but perhaps not. that's not sort of the most exact thing to do. Uh, and the other thing we can do is to actually generate RNA sequences also from, this, uh, from the same species. And we can do this either by short read sequencing, which will generate many reads, or we can also do long read RNA sequencing where we get the entire genes and the entire isoforms. And of course, that's sort of the ideal thing to do, but perhaps it's more expensive and you need to sort of use multiple technologies here. Uh, and when you're thinking about RNA sequencing, you also need to think about, okay, which tissues uh, should I be sequencing here to get all the genes from this individual? Uh, so we prefer doing RNA sequencing, but yeah, it can still be a challenging thing. Here. Uh, and when we have the genome sequenced, annotated, we also need to make it available somewhere. And I think that there are a lot of discussions uh, in the Earth by Genome Project on how to do this. But one word here that is very important is all, always this FAIR, that it should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and re reproducible. So uh, there will be guidelines, I suppose, on how to do this uh, within the Earth by Genome Project. That's a a very big thing. Uh, and we are involved, or Olga especially, is very much involved in this Earth Biogenome project. And there are a lot of challenges, of course, when trying to sequence everything and so sort of in, in the big way like this. Uh, but the good news is that we're not doing it alone. It's not a, uh, sort of something that we are, we don't have to come up with all the solutions. Uh, so what we're hoping is that we can do some things uh, that gains to the Earth by Genome project, but also that sort of we can get many things back. Uh, and there will be a lot of lot of things happening in this area going forward. Uh, okay, any questions on this part? Okay, uh, then I can just briefly touch upon some other things that we're doing, just because I sort of find these very interesting. So we have a group uh, within the genomics platform that is consisting of both NGI and also ancient genomics and uh, some single cell platforms uh, where we're trying to think about uh, what kind of research and development should we be doing going forward. Uh, so I think this is very nice that we have also a like a Trello board with small and big projects that we're uh, working on. Uh, and examples of things that we're doing, this is an old slide, but it can just show sort of uh, what we are, things that we are doing. And one very important thing for us is of course, to test new technologies. So for example, in 2020, we were testing the MGI machine. Uh, this was the Chinese company that ran into problems with the, uh, with the lawyers. Uh, so 
we did some things, but sort of had to scrap that one. Uh, it was not interesting anymore. Uh, PacPy is equal to E, so so the, that's the new high throughput instrument from from PacBio. That was also something that we tested, and that that turned out to be really successful. So that's the technology that we're keeping and sort of running quite a lot now. Uh, and another thing was Mission Bio, the tapestry system. So that's the thing for doing targeted sequencing and single cells. It's and it turned out that this was. Uh, this was uh, sort of very interesting for the clinical community. So what happened is that sort of there is a machine now, but it's not in our platform, but instead uh, over at the hospital where also researchers can, can access it. Um, so that's one of the important missions is to, to test these different technologies. I don't know if I need to go in here. Uh, yeah, and I have some other, some other things that we have been working on. Uh, is the Olink Explorer. I think this is a really cool thing because we are now for the first time using NGS, uh, but not for studying DNA or, or RNA. So this is a, for reading out protein levels. Uh, so what happens is that we have proteins uh, where there are these padlock probes attached, and then we can get, uh, if a specific protein is present, then we can get amplification of the DNA molecule that is also barcoded in some specific way. Uh, and we can then sequence these amplicons to get a feeling for what is the level of the different proteins in this particular sample. Uh, and at NGI, we were, uh, I think, the first provider of this type of sequencing in Europe. And yeah, this product from Olink has sort of become really interesting for many labs now. Uh, one thing that I'm very interested in is CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Uh, so we're trying now to develop methods to see what really happens after having done CRISPR editing. Because, I mean, this gene scissor, everyone is talking about it, it can sort of change bases in the DNA, but, but it's not always that exact. And we think that we can be using these with long read sequencing methods we can sort of try to look at this in a more unbiased way and sort of see what, what really happens at these off targets and other types of effects of, of CRISPR. Uh, COVID-19 was also interesting. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's that interesting nowadays, but, um, but when it came along, we sort of also focus on development of many methods for, for looking at this. So it could either be straightforward sequencing of uh, of the virus from infected patients. Uh, so there are many assays now for, for doing this type of sequencing and we have been testing several of these. Uh, or it could be sequencing of the host genomes. I mean, sequencing of many human individuals to see which, one, which ones uh, are more success, susceptible for severe COVID-19 and trying to find the genetic basis for that. Uh, and I should mention that we're also doing now the sequencing of the wastewater. So that's a project that is still ongoing. And we have set up now uh, a method for sequencing of wastewater plants around Sweden, like a surveillance of, of sort of the mutations that come up. Uh, and it turned out that we can actually find mutations in the sewage water, which is uh, really cool, I think. Uh, single cell sequencing, we're doing quite a lot of, a lot of that. Much of it is done at the single cell platforms, but we've also been involved sort of from the long read perspective in this. Uh, so one thing that we have been trying to do is to sequence the genome of one single cell with long read technologies. And that's very challenging because normally long read sequencing requires a lot of DNA. So we all, of course need to do some type of amplification first to do this. Uh, but we have been doing it. It's not a perfect like assembly of the single cell genome, but, but it, at least it's one of the first, uh, I think, described methods to do this. Uh, yeah, and of course, there are also many things that I have not covered here. And I'm sure that many of you are working on these, sort of, I don't know, chip-seq or RNA-seq things. And you didn't get much out of this presentation, but I mean, please come talk to us about your specific project as well. And we can sort of see what we can discuss there because there are just so many things. And single cell, uh, I haven't talked about, which is a very big thing, and also epigenetics. 
Yeah, but let's save this for perhaps Friday or uh, I don't know, or during lunch or any time. Okay, and this is just to finish off with that slide on sort of some of the things that we've been sequencing at NGI. Uh, and I should also mention that we are having, we're hosting a, a long read conference uh, this fall uh, with Olga and we are organizing. Uh, so if any of you are interested, I don't even have a slide up here on it. It will be on October 31st to November 2nd in the big uh, university hall here in Uppsala. Uh, so it will be both scientific presentations and also workshops and the sort of big companies will be there as well. Uh, okay, so thank you for listening. And do you have any questions on anything? Yes. Uh, I was just curious about this wastewater sequencing project. Yeah. I have to do like, for example, COVID. What, what does the data look like? Is, is, it, is that data that can be used to ask completely unrelated questions because now you have a huge wealth of sequencing data from wastewater or yeah that's time. a very good question so so what we have been doing in this specific project is i mean we start off with the wastewater and then a lot of work was put in i mean not not by, by us but sort of to to extract uh high quality rna or high quality i mean it is not high quality but as good quality as possible rna from from the wastewater samples uh so I guess that that RNA is available somewhere, but, but what we are actually doing when we're sequencing the RNA is that we're doing an amplification. So there is a panel that is targeting only SARS-CoV-2. Okay. Uh, so we amplify the SARS-CoV-2 virus and we have to do that sort of to get sufficient signals to find the mutations. But I mean, we have, as a starting material, we have the whole sort of RNA soup. Uh, and I guess that there will be other stuff in there as well which is sequenced no it's not no, sequenced it, but, but we, 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 we could have been doing it i mean we could have sequenced total rna instead of you know doing amplification of the sars cov 2 uh, but lower signal than covid yeah. yeah but maybe for we'll find some other things that are interesting maybe this is a naive question but what makes a good or a bad genome annotation because uh um, yeah. What, what do you have to consider? To yeah, I can just briefly answer it and then all get perhaps can yeah. jump in. But uh, we're using what we are using is something called BUSCO scores, usually. So that's something that will tell you uh, how many of the like expected gene models are we covering in, in complete. I don't know exactly how the BUSCO score is actually. But... I guess that it would be a little bit tricky when you don't know, for instance, for this uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, new species, and you don't know I the genetic you. variation and things like that. Yes. Uh, so they do you take that into account? Yes. So they actually work in the development of Busco. So they try to create gene models for different organism groups. But interestingly enough, now, um, even if we look at the non-model species, we can figure out how many of the genes might look complete also how many genes are duplicated and so on. But yes, from the beginning, it was human only. But now there is development just for the Earth Biogenome Project when they're trying to improve those folks on the way how it works. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe I can mention there as well. I mean, the human genome, um, it's been sequenced for, I don't know, 20 plus years. But as you maybe saw this year, they released the complete human genome again. So, so it's like, <laughs> We, we have now the genome without any gaps. Uh, and what they also did find uh, in that study is that they also detected, I don't remember how many, but was it like 50 or 100 like protein coding genes new that, that no one has seen before. So, I mean, the annotation, I mean, even for the human genome it was, was apparently not complete. So I guess it's even worse for other species. Yeah, it's a moving target. It is. As I told you, bioinformatics is not an exact science, unfortunately. But what I could do actually, perhaps Adam, you can type it in the chat box for a long read meeting. Oh. L R U A. Shugi, Shugi, Tor. Yes. Yeah. That's the link. 
So the early bird is closing very soon. You can ask your bosses to send you to this conference. So there will be um, day one and two scientific discussions. So we have sessions on both biodiversity genomics and also human. And there will be also for people speaking about single cell. Yeah. A single cell and RNA belong reads. And then the last day, there will be company organized workshops when people will be demonstrating nanopore sequencing in real life. And also, by developers will be talking about their tools. So, if you want to venture into the long read things, that it's a golden opportunity to meet with experts and to listen. There is also a poster session. I think we closed poster abstracts, but perhaps if you really, really, really want to. We could perhaps accommodate one or two. Yeah. We have any other questions, discussion points? So maybe just for me, I mean, what kind of, because I've been talking mainly about DNA sequencing, but I suspect that there are also a lot of like RNA people here. So how many of you have RNA projects? So that's what you have. Yes. Uh, and do you have a feeling for sort of how, how you will uh, how you will analyze the data? Is it is not clear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but there are many RNA sequencing experts uh, at ANVIS. So, so that's something that I mean they're really great at that. So yeah. I think that they can help you out with um, I mean figuring out both sort of the pipelines and also perhaps the more downstream, uh, more statistical uh, analysis that you want to do. 